I'm Dr. Joseph M.T., Department of Sociology, University of Mumbai. This is the E-Part Shala project on religion and society. Module 35, Tele-Evangelism. Tele-Evangelism is uh, a word that refers to the mega events that religious performance has become through which religious personalities and religious organizations are targeting wider or audiences using the the developments in media tele-evangelism started in the united states of america and elsewhere where evangelists used the television as a stage to reach out to millions and millions of people to influence them and this became a phenomenon in, in itself now in this module we look at its uh, kind of spread in different parts of the world especially in india and we have a case study of baba ramdev and sri sri ravi shankar in this module where we uh, we look at them as uh, examples and case studies of tele-evangelism in India. Section 1, History of Tele-Evangelism and Religious Identification. This section will aim at tracing the history of tele-evangelism and its role as a form of religious identification. In order to do so, the works of Hadden and Swan, Frankel and Schultze have been listed. It will look at the different ways in which tele-evangelism has been understood by the above-mentioned scholars. In brief, televangelism, according to Hudden and Swan, is a hybrid concept fusing the terms television and evangelism that refers to the use of television as a means of propagating the message of faiths to masses. The works of Hudden and Schultz trace the rise of televangelism to the revivalist movements of the 19th century America. Frankel attributes it to the revival of ministries of Charles Finney, Dw Dwight Moody and Billy Sunday. Schultz argues that the era of tele-evangelism tele -evangelism must be seen in the context of the American dream, propagating ideas of success, technological utopia, and so on. Sociologist Jeffrey H. K. Hudden coined the term tele-evangelism in reference to the phenomenon of evangelist broadcasting occurring in the wake of the deregulation of the U.S. broadcasting system. In the 1920s, though religious programs were included in the radio station broadcasting in the U.S., it was considered to create headaches. However, beginning in the 1960s with the deregulation of radio and television stations, several evangelists began to view technology as a medium to spread their message to the masses. Around this time, there were networks of religious broadcasting being formed, such as the Christian Broadcasting Network, founded by Pat Robertson, networks by Paul Crouch and Jim Barker, and so on. Moreover, tele-evangelist practices are in tandem with the emphasis on the individual in neoliberal times. It promotes the idea of salvation resting on the individual pursuits and efforts rather than being solely defined by God's grace. The rising power of the visual manifested in the popularity of televisions sets now the social media appendages have managed to garner a mass for the consumption of tele-evangelist messages. Here it is re redefining the way people experience and practice religiosity. For an insight into this discussion, Frankel's texts are useful. Further, in the nine, late 1980s, the world of tele-evangelism was shaken by a series of financial and sexual scandals. But as can be perceived by the continuing growth of tele-evangelism in regions and religions apart from the West, it now needs to be understood against the changing scapes of commodification, consumerism and contestations. Section 2. Commodification, Consumption and the Branding of Religion in Tele-Evangelism Tele-Evangelism was popularized in the U.S. during the era of 1960s marked by a competitive, deregulated commercial television ambit. It continued to dominate for the next two decades. Here, Jeffrey Hadden's article on the rise and fall of tele-evangelism in America addresses the structural outlets for religious broadcasting, namely the broadcasting network structures and the role of the local religious television stations. He attributes the survival of religious broadcasting to these two structures. In the era of globalization, one needs to think beyond communication structures in terms of simply technological advancements. There is a redefinition of cultural and political spaces experienced through the processes of commodification and consumption. This section will engage the re readers in a cross-textual analysis of the manner in which television has shaped religious practices and markets. 
Through a careful reading of the suggested text, an attempt will be made to understand the interlinkages between contemporary forms of tele-evangelism and its impact on shaping religion as a discourse and a brand, as a consumable entity available to public life. While one needs to acknowledge that there has always been a material aspect to religions, tele-evangelism in the age of globalization has initiated and reproduced packages of religion as inhabiting spaces of cultural production such as shopping centers, sports stadiums, and so forth. The debates on commodification of religion and the role of tele-evangelism, however, are not without contestations. Thomas, 2008, in this context, highlights the debate as that of whether commodification hinders the spiritual or whether it enhances the spiritual in a context wherein the consumer negotiates between the use value and the status value of the product, in this case religion. Here, while works of Sinha aim to highlight the emotive and the social value of commodified religion, as in the case of religious objects such as flowers and perfumes used in the everyday that enhance the spiritual domain, Thomas and Lee warns against the overarching logic of commodification of religion to diversify and strengthen one's personal fortunes and empires. Another strand of debate deals with the issue of branding and rebranding faith. Here, the role of popular culture is implicated in crafting a version of religion that is accessible to the audience at large. Indian evangelist Baba Ramdev, among others, is an example of such trends. In illustrating the brand Ramdev, Thomas and Lee point out, they are nationally and globally recognized brands whose messages and products tap into the religious needs of the middle classes in particular, and whose ministries facilitate the communication of an accessible God. In the case of Baba Ramdev, yoga, a traditional Indian exercise for the mind and body, has become the basis for a multi-billion dollar health and well-being empire. Thus, it is important to study ways in which Tele-evangelism has been commodified through its production and reproduction across platforms. Section 3. Tele-evangelism and the political project. Context contesting meanings. The substance of tele-evangelism now cannot be dismissed as artificial processes. Though tele-evangelism was conceived of in the U.S. today, world religions at large have embraced it to further their spread and impact. It is now defined and shaped by movements and expressions legitimate in their own right. Thus, there is a need to understand the working of these cultural and political expressions in their context. By doing so, one can hope to understand the potential of tele-evangelist efforts in situations of harmonizing or debilitating solidarities. This has led to myriad ways in which religions have been recasted through the lens of tele-evangelism. This section aims at bringing out debates and case studies of this phenomenon. The tele-evangelism operating in Hindu and Islamic traditions, for instance, though influenced by its Western counterparts in self-help religions, however, have its own hybrid characteristics reflective of the particular context. At the same time, it problematizes a simplistic binary of the global and the local, as will be exemplified in the case studies undertaken in this section. In order to study tele-evangelism in the context of Islamic traditions, the work of Ek Shiabi dealing with the phenomenon of self-help gurus in Kuwaiti Islamic channels, Dorothea Schultz's work on meditation of Islamic public discourse by the Muslim movement, and Sadina in Mali will be undertaken. The spread of tele-evangelism in the Indian context will be dealt with by referring to the works of Jonathan D. James, Shantanu Chakrabarti. Through the works of the above, one hopes to highlight the simultaneous process of rejection of religious authority and its remediation by new authority as undertaken by tele-evangelist practices. These processes too are differentiated on the basis of the context, for instance, while on the one hand, in the context of Judaic faiths, there is a tussle to spread the messages to audiences who are looking at religion in line, of, line with the era. On the other hand, the proliferation of new sources of religious authorities in the form of godmen and godwomen have not challenged Hinduism, rather provided a fascinating appendage to Hinduism. However, this is not to argue that attempts at criticizing the New Age gurus haven't emerged from within the folds of Hinduism. Here, the seminal work of Jonathan D. James titled Magdonaldization, Masala McGospel and Om Economics, Tele-Evangelism in Contemporary India, provides an entry point into the debates on the concerns over forms of tele-evangelist practices in the South Asian context by relating it to questions of power and politics. He examines the changing forms and style of preaching in churches in India by understanding the shift in the landscape in terms of entry of television and its influence on the Protestant church and Hindu community in India. 
Both Christian tele-evangelism and Hindu tele-evangelism will be discussed through this reading, enriched with examples from case studies. Other works such as that of Mankekar, Raj Gopal and are useful references in order to study the television culture in India. Mankeka looks at close at the close identification of television and religious identity in India along with the political bent of screening cultures by understanding the formation of womanhood on a, in a nation state. Raj Gopal discusses pro pro prolifically the impact of a television on religious nationalism and the shaping of the Indian audience at large. What is important about Raj Gopal's work is the way in which he is able to show the role of media technologies in the construction of a religious nationalism, which on the face of it might appear to be merely an act of engagement with religious symbolisms at the level of everyday life, but which in its deeper constructs provides the potent glue for uniting together a religious community across the length and breadth of subcontinental geography which might never have been possible in the absence of such media constrained technologies of religious nationalism. The screening of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata on Indian television made possible a form of cultural bonding across the length and breadth of India that would have remained forever impossible in the absence of such technologies. It is not surprising then that in the era of globalization that gets ushered in with the Indian economy strategically moving in the direction of neoliberalism, one also observes the rise of a religious communitarianism both within the majority and the minority community that is hugely sustained by gurus and godmen and women. It is these communities that today also constitute the bulk of support that is obtained for religious nationalism not only in India but in different parts of the global south. To that extent, it becomes problematic to evaluate the competing returns of media tele-evangelism, whether these be in the sphere of commodification and consumption or in the construction of what some might call a religious communitarianism. In either case, Raj Gopal's work points to the role of how religion as a cultural resource services the interest of dominant ideologies who control these media technologies. Furthermore, closely related to this concern is the role of the political economy in ushering certain types of tele-evangelism. Here the role of the state and its relationship with minorities through legislative means play a crucial role in manufacturing religious capital. For instance, in the case of India, the spread of Christianity television by Pentecostal evangelists has been attributed to a significant degree to the edging out of minority religions in state broadcasting. In this regard, essays in this section will also try to tease out the conditions and consequences of the political economy on tele-evangelism. Section 4, Tele-Evangelism and the Indian Context. This section will study more closely the works on tele-evangelism and its consequences in the Indian scenario. In the Indian context, the works of Jonathan T. D. James, Philip Nine and Thomas, Purnima Mankekar, Arvind Raj Gopal will be closely followed. Firstly, it is important to study the conditions in India that makes the phenomenon of tele-evangelism possible. As argued by James, a context-based study of tele-evangelism will highlight the local needs, expectations and aesthetics, apart from the larger global project of tele-evangelist efforts. In this context, the site of tele-evangelist practice in India has been traced to the advent of the satellite television in the 1990s. The work of Jonathan D. James is vital in entering the discussion on tele-evangelism in India. In his work, Tele-Evangelism, and in particular the case studies of his work focused on Christian tele-evangelism in the South, whereby he drew an, a Ritzerian analogy describing the mixing of Indian and U.S. gospel programs as Masala McGospel on the lines of McDonaldization as he argues that the overarching structures of the global has, has a great influence on the local dynamics of tele-evangelist practices. Here he suggests a shift in the practices of the Protestant Church in India from its colonial moorings to the popular Christianity models of the U.S. Few of the instances of such a shift as elab elaborated by him includes the choice of chorus scores rather than hymns and the use of experiential pastoral techniques above preaching from texts. Furthermore, in another study by Chakrabarti, a discussion on New Age tele-evangelism practices in India is discussed. Hence, here the figure of Baba Ramdev and his politics has been discussed extensively by undertaking a rigorous analysis of his shows, sermons, seminars and so on. 
a prime focus of this work is to highlight the manner in which New Age religious figures have played into a politics of poverty where on one hand its practitioners include the rising urban middle class and on the other hand the workers from rural and urban centers. In this regard, Chakrabarti's work highlights the neoliberal nature of tele-evangelist propaganda and shifts the gaze from religious politics to politics of religion in a globalizing economy. In this context, it may be also worth mentioning that apart from Chakrabarti's observation about the ideological function of tele-evangelism in a neoliberal setting, more importantly for these new age gurus like Baba, Baba Ramdev and Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, tele-evangelism is also a site in which they bring together the marketing concerns of their religious health commodities in contact, in contact with the vast and growing population in both rural and urban areas who have emerged as their new age audiences. Such strategies then illustrate how tele-evangelism, apart from its professed engagement with preaching the doctrinal messages of a given faith, is deeply enmeshed in the structures of market business and capital to create vast empires of religious economies that often escape the attention of mainstream economists on grounds that such economies inhabit the presumably esoteric domains of culture, religion and culture. In order to further substantiate one's understanding of tele-evangelism in India, this section will address the ways in which the audience engages with the content and meaning of tele-evangelist efforts. The Indian context is distinct in its own way as characterized by a secular foundation along with deep religious underpinnings. In this context, the work of Thomas and Mitchell has noted the reception of religious broadcasting by the Mark Thoma community in Kerala. Another crucial work in this field is by Thomas on Christian consumers of tele-evangelism in Chennai. In the light of the above, the practice of gifting television sets to families of lower income has led to possibly greater access of individuals and groups to television channels. This can be observed in the case of Tamil Nadu. Further, the entry of smartphones has led to decreased reliance on television to receive one's news. Now with a click, one can access a wide array of entertainment and news networks. What this has meant is that tele-evangelism is no longer only a phenomenon experienced through access to a television medium and network, rather it is available round the clock across a plenitude of platforms. This has led to an increasingly complex network of production, distribution and consumption of religious broadcasting across the world. Thomas and Lee, in their critical analysis of the phenomenon of tele-evangelism in India, argue that the mobile operators have segmented the market in a four-way schematic order of A, B, C, D, astrology, Bollywood, cricket and devotion. These value-added services provide one an option to begin the day with a prayer, watch devotional videos, videos telecasted live from shrines, and so on. Further, tele-evangelism has provided a platform for the secular to be sacralized. This can be observed in the case of religious quizzes, shows and serials such as CBN's Kushi Ki Dunia in India and Pakistan's game show Alif Lam Meme, designed on the lines of the popular game show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? where the ultimate price is pilgrimage deal to Mecca for two. Thus, the recasting of religion in popular forms of culture has led to its further appeal to audiences. Hence, the new communicative technologies have been instrumental in creating an audience for tele-evangelism in the public life. In this module, we have looked at uh, tele-evangelism. Now, tele-evangelism means uh, that uh, the kind of mega events that religious propagation has been or religious discourses has been and how some of these religious personalities have turned their religious practice into products that, are, that have an appeal, international appeal between the borders of nations. And uh, a particular case in, uh, case in point is Baba Ramdev and his spiritualized products and how also the kind of proliferation of channels in uh, television that cater to the religious tastes of people belonging to different religious organizations. Now we have seen all these developments and analyzed them in this module. Thank you.